Hi, this is Chris Ganson at the Office of Planning and Research. We're going to wait a few minutes for everybody to file into the webinar and then get started. Hello, this is Chris Ganson at the Office of Planning and Research. We're going to wait just another minute or two and then get started with the webinar. Hello, this is Chris Ganson with the Office of Planning and Research. Uh, we'll go ahead and get the webinar started now. So we'll start with some logistics. Um, first, this webinar session is being recorded and we intend to post the recording online uh, to make this 
uh, information available to people who weren't able to attend at this hour. Um, we have everyone in muted phone lines. Uh, there's going to be between 150 and 200 people on the line today. Um, so we'll be doing question and answer um, via the webinar, the GoToWebinar um, uh, question box. Um, so we'll take some clarifying questions during the presentation. We'll have, uh, a couple of folks here looking at your questions and uh, and uh, posing them to us at, at uh, the correct at the at the best moments. Um, and then we'll have longer questions uh, at the end. We'll have a good amount of time for question and answer um, when we finish the presentation portion. Um, you'll see in the GoToWebinar system there is a question box. That's where we'll accept questions. And uh, last, if you have any technical problems with your GoToWebinar uh, arrangement. We have GoToWebinar's phone number um, down here on the bottom of this slide. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? First, some background. Why are we here? Um, why uh, the decision at the state level to move away from LOS and towards vehicle miles traveled in CEQA? Um, second, we're going to talk about our updated draft materials, what we have just put out for public comment. Um, third, we'll run through some case studies that use, that apply those materials. Um, fourth, we'll talk about next steps, um, kind of a calendar of what is coming up, um, how, um, uh, the, uh, when the process will unfold, and what the major milestones are. And fifth, we'll talk about some related initiatives, including the Caltrans TAG TISG and uh, general plans and impact fees. So with that, let's launch into background. So I'm going to start with a schematic. And those of you who have been following this process have uh, may have seen this before. So um, given that some folks may have seen this before, we'll, we'll uh, move along at a somewhat quick pace. Um, on the screen is a schematic of a city with an infill development located in the city center and some outlying development along the uh, right side and top. And when uh, an infill, such an infill development is built, it loads relatively little vehicle travel onto the roadway network because it's close to destinations relatively and generally. Um, there's oftentimes other modal options available besides driving. Uh, so not that much BMT is added to the network. Uh, and yet, infill development tends to trigger numerous LOS impacts. And that's because, uh, by definition, it's last in development. And last in development is adding traffic to the existing traffic. So when uh, infill development goes into areas, especially vibrant areas with lots of activity, it tends to trigger LOS impacts. Let's contrast that with an outlying development, a greenfield development on the urban periphery. So that development loads quite a bit more vehicle travel onto the uh, roadway network. Um, a, a typical amount is three or four times as much vehicle travel loaded onto the roadway network. Um, but it has relatively few LOS impacts because it's, by definition, the first in development. So uh, it's facing uh, emptier roads when it goes in. Um, that's not to say that this project does not generate more traffic or cause more delay. Um, it's just that the LOS metric is very localized and tends to focus on the traffic right around the project. So by the time the traffic from the project gets into congested areas, um, it does so in a dispersed fashion, which flies under the radar for LOS. Um, these sorts of projects, therefore, contribute to regional congestion uh, without um, uh, triggering uh, LOS. So another issue, uh, here's a, a picture of a roadway LOSA. And uh, you can consider whether that's the sort of thing that your city uh, wants, or this uh, LOSF roadway. This happens to be um, University Avenue in Palo Alto. Um, it is the street with the highest tax base in the city of California. Um, various stakeholders over time, and especially as, uh, uh, as in the lead up to uh, the time 743 was passed, uh, brought 
uh, reasons to the Office of Planning and Research why LOS was problematic as a measure of transportation impact used in CEQA. And we've done our best to catalog those um, issues brought to us by stakeholders, and, and I've listed them here on this slide. So let's run through those. Um, the first is that it punishes last-in development, inhibits infill, and uh, thereby pushes development outward. That's um, kind of alluded to in the slides I just went through with the city schematic. Um, because LOS uh, is triggers more impacts for infill development, uh, it's easier to just go build out in the urban periphery. Second, it solves local congestion, uh, but exacerbates regional congestion. When you build automobile capacity in response to congestion, um, building that additional capacity invites more automobile traffic. And that traffic is laden onto the region's roadways. And uh, if you look outside in most major metropolitan areas, you can see that that has, in fact, overburdened the regional roadway system. Third, it inhibits transit. Um, an example is uh, the bus rapid transit uh, project in San Francisco. Uh, there's a couple of bus rapid transit projects in San Francisco. Um, ran into the problem that they, they were increasing substantially the number of people moved along the corridor. Um, but had to find a way to accommodate the same number of automobiles as before. Um, LOS focuses on uh, vehicles, not on people. And because transit is so efficient at moving people in few vehicles, um, it tends to get disadvantaged by um, the application of an LOS metric. Fourth, use of LOS inhibits active transportation. And that's because uh, cyclists and pedestrians to LOS are uh, impediments to transportation rather than transportation in its own right. So to improve LOS, it often makes sense to uh, eliminate a pedestrian crossing so that cars may flow um, more freely. Uh, or to not add a bike lane so you can uh, add an additional car lane uh, so, again, cars may flow more freely. Um, this is important uh, for a number of, of reasons, um, and one of them is the, the health benefits that the state could um, uh, attain by having more active transportation um, is lost by not providing these active transportation facilities. And there's research showing that we have, um, that we could save billions of dollars on health care um, if we could get folks out on, on their bikes and their feet um, uh, more. A fifth reason is that LOS is a metric um, of mobility rather than access to destinations. So it's sure to show failure in the big picture, even when we achieve uh, what we want to do in the, in the state of California, which is get people to their destinations. And uh, there's an example here in, in the, uh, the diagram, the picture here, um, from the city, uh, the, the uh, Denver area, which over the 25-year period, 1982 to 2007, um, they it, it did a, a good amount of infill development. They uh, consistently through that through that time, and uh, the extra traffic from that infill development added a lot of extra rush hour delay. You can see they went from uh, 4.2 to 11.7 minutes of rush hour delay. Um, so Denver did terrible for transportation, right? The, the delay got, got worse by a factor of two and a half. And, you know, LOS is a metric, um, roughly speaking, of delay. Um, however, if you look at average travel time, average travel time, time went down in that area, in, in, the, in that uh, region, in the Denver region. Now, how could that happen? And the answer is that when you add destinations into the urban fabric, people don't have to go as far to get where they want to go because you, they can go to the new destinations. So uh, we have to think both of proximity and mobility. If we focus on just mobility, um, in a state like ours where we are endeavoring to use tr both transportation and land use tools to achieve greenhouse gas targets and reduce vehicle miles traveled, um, we're sure to show failure using mobility metrics like LOS, even when we have succeeded in getting people better to their destinations. The sixth issue is that LOS doesn't actually even measure automobile mobility that well. 
it, it fails to even optimize the network for automobiles. And that's simply because it turns out that optimizing intersection by intersection is not the way to optimize a roadway network. Um, those who are traffic engineers on the line may recognize Bray's paradox, this diagram here. Um, there are, there, Bray's paradox essentially says that uh, there are cases in which you can uh, expand an intersection, relieve a bottleneck, and worsen the whole system by creating a worse bottleneck downstream when the traffic flows more freely and clogs up there instead. Um, so that's an extreme example, uh, but it's common if you if you try and, inter a, and optimize intersection by intersection um, to do much less well than you could. And that's what um, LOS and CEQA tends to do, optimize intersection by intersection. Um, seven, uh, mitigating LOS forces more roadway construction than most jurisdictions can afford to maintain. So there was a, a survey done, I believe it was recently by the Local Government Commission, um, looking at uh, how many California cities and counties could afford to maintain the pavement that they uh, had already laid down. And the, the answer was, uh, I, I forget, it was in the single digits. I think it was under five. Um, so it doesn't necessarily make sense to keep laying down additional pavement when you don't know how you're going to pay for the existing pavement you have. Um, and uh, using LOS and CEQA doesn't allow for making those sorts of trade-offs with cost, for example, uh, but also with other factors like um, the environment. And eight, uh, LOS is both hard to calculate and pretty inaccurate. So in order to calculate LOS for a given location, uh, you first need to model where all the traffic from a certain project will go, um, which is a very uncertain science. The error bars in that um, uh, analysis tend to be in the 30 to 40 percent range, except for the largest of streets. And that 30 to 40 percent, um, that figure with 30, 40 percent error, then is has micro simulation performed on it. You have the volume, you do the micro simulation from there, which can exacerbate that error. Um, we often present LOS, um, uh, the, the numbers behind LOS is if they were accurate to the third or fourth significant figure, uh, but really we barely have one significant figure, if that. So OPR went through an extensive process looking at different metrics and um, uh, came, we, we had a, a public release of a draft presenting various metrics that we um, had gotten from stakeholders as recommendations. And um, the great majority of the response was for vehicle miles traveled as a replacement metric and um, gathered some of the reasons for that here. First, uh, using VMT and CEQA removes a key barrier to infill and transit-oriented development. Uh, second, it streamlines transit and active transportation projects because they tend to reduce vehicle miles traveled. Uh, third, VMT is quite a bit easier to model. Um, uh, the uh, consultants we've talked to that do both LOS and VMT modeling have been telling us that uh, VMT modeling takes uh, between 10 and 20 percent of the resources of LOS modeling. Uh, fourth, VMT is already in use. Um, you need to calculate VMT in order to do your greenhouse, gases uh, your greenhouse gas emissions assessment, which is also required in CEQA. Um, and there are court cases um, that require uh, VMT to be um, included in CEQA today. Um, so that, that it was already done and already required um, made it uh, an easy metric, um, an easy choice to, to, uh, <coughs> to, um, it, to specify for SB 743. Um, Fifth, reduction in infrastructure, capital, and maintenance costs. VMT doesn't end you up laying down additional pavement to maintain, um, so you don't create a cost burden there. Um, sixth, uh, you attack regional congestion more effectively because you're reducing the amount of vehicle travel in the area rather than uh, accommodating vehicle travel locally and dumping, dumping it onto your regional um, roadway network. Seventh, uh, there are health benefits that are quite profound connected to the potential for active transportation um, uh, travel uh, and transit travel, which generally involves um, an active transportation trip on your way to the stop. And eighth, uh, and last but not least, uh, a VMT 
T in CEQA aligns well with GHG in CEQA and elsewhere and our, our um, state goals at large to reduce greenhouse gases, whereas LOS tended to have the opposite effect and was misaligned with uh, current state policy. There are an array of effects of high VMT development. Um, we've collected a body of substantial evidence, which is summarized in these bullets here. Um, I'm not going to go through all these because it would take a while, and I want to make sure to get to our um, presentation on the, the changes we've made in the guidelines. Um, but there are, are quite a bit of connections between high VMT development and environmental impact, health impact, and uh, cost increases. Each one of the bullets on this slide has a connected either paper, academic paper, or body of literature. Okay. Um, pause. Any questions so far? One question. We'll, we'll, okay. We'll take. We'll uh, take in a little while. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. So, uh, estimating. Oh, I, I want to talk a little bit about the the a couple of methods of estimating vehicle miles traveled. Um, so. The technical advisory that we just put out, it actually, this is unchanged from the, the draft we put out previously, um, <clears throat> specifies uh, how you might use a tour-based model uh, or use a trip-based model um, in order to get VMT. And so just as background to uh, what we're going to talk, what our recommendations, um, I, I want to talk through that. So uh, here on the screen is a, a, a kind of a picture of a tour-based uh, a, a tour based assessment of a day. So uh, a resident in the house uh, might go to the coffee shop on their way to work, trips one and two, and, and then uh, take lunch and drive over to the Chili's restaurant, uh, come back to work, and at the end of the day, drive back trip number five uh, to the house. And then uh, drive uh, out to a store, trip number six, and back home again, seven. So that's um, uh, just an a, a example of a, of a day and, and a, a tour. And tour-based models um, think of that first tour, the whole tour that was part of the, of, that the workplace was part of as the work tour. And uh, the second tour, the six and, uh, trip six and seven, as the shopping tour. And together, uh, it all makes household VMT. In fact, the total household VMT would be all of this travel for all of the inhabitants of the house. And, and I mention this because in our guidance we point to using household VMT or household VMT per capita, and that's household VMT divided by the number of occupants of the house. And then you can look at that, of course, at a city level, um, uh, divide by the total number of people in the households and the total amount of VMT uh, on these tours. These tours, again, uh, may stay within the city. They may, go, they may go outside of the city and stay within the region. Uh, they may occasionally um, uh, go beyond the region. Um, uh, in some cases, there's some regions which have particularly high amounts of interregional travel. So I wanted to compare that to a trip estimating VMT in a trip-based fashion. So another example, a uh, person goes to work and comes home, trips one and two, uh, they head to the coffee shop uh, after that, uh, from home, um, drive from the coffee shop to the store, and then back home, trip number five. Um, so home-based VMT it, it includes any of the trips that have a trip end at the household. So trips one, two, three, and five. But you'll notice that trip four went, th went from... Uh, one uh, retail location to another um, didn't have a trip in at home, and that would not be counted um, under home-based VMT. So in a trip-based assessment with a trip-based uh, model, um, you're looking at home-based VMT rather than full household VMT, which would include the fourth trip, uh, sorry, trip number four. Um, and I'm raising all this um, because as we, we uh, get into the methodology, uh, you'll see that in some cases we need to use home-based VMT. In uh, some cases we can use household VMT. In some cases we, can, uh, we, we need to use home-based VMT because that's all the data we have available. Um, so with that, let's move on to talk about the materials that we have just released, um, both what remains the same 
and uh, that which has been updated and changed. So first, that which remains the same, we are continuing to recommend vehicle miles traveled as the primary metric of transportation impact um, in CEQA, and that is uh, a statewide deployment. That remains the same as um, in the previous draft that we put out. Um, we continue to recommend using VMT screening maps for residential and office projects. And an example of one is to the right. This is um, one generated by the California Statewide Travel Demand Model um, for the Fresno area. And it shows that you can see the green areas, uh, the light and dark green represent um, below, 15% uh, uh, below, the, be below, 15 percent below uh, the regional VMT, overall VMT per capita. Um, so uh, we also um, recommend presuming that development near transit uh, should lead to a less than significant impact with some exceptions, uh, including if the floor area ratio is, is too uh, low, if the parking, if the, if the building is over parked compared to minimum requirements, or if it's inconsistent with the SES. Uh, we also continue our recommendation that tr uh, transit, active transportation, and active transportation projects be presumed less than significant because they will tend to reduce VMT rather than add VMT. Um, and uh, we continue to include a notice that more stringent thresholds may be applied at lead agency discretion. Um, now, many of you are probably aware that traditionally lead agencies uh, develop thresholds of significance for, for various metrics. Um, under CEQA, and that continues to be the case. Um, the technical advisory, um, I'll, I'll discuss in a moment, um, the, the, the technical advisory provides, provides, simply provides advice on um, how to set those thresholds. Um, so uh, here there's a question. Uh, you know, question. How does home-based DNT calculation account for trips associated with new commercial or industrial? How does, can you read that one more time? Sure. Yeah, actually, do you mind coming, uh, I'm not sure folks on the phone can hear that, so let me um, get our question reader a little yeah, closer. Sahar Shirazi is, is uh, also heads our general planning effort and has been kind enough to help with this webinar. Um, we had a question from the group, a clarifying question on uh, home-based VMT. The question is, how does home-based VMT calculations account for trips associated with a new commercial or industrial land use? Yeah, great question. So um, home-based VMT would not, um, we don't provide detailed recommendations for, um, for example, uh, industrial projects, um, uh, but a, a home-based, except for the commute portion of industrial uh, projects, uh, um, Except for the commute portion, uh, home-based travel would not be what you'd want to look at there. Um, so the answer is that that would, will feature in uh, our methodology, our recommended methodology for uh, residential development and for um, the commute trip in particular, the home-based work trip will feature in our recommendation for uh, office development. Um, but um, good point, you wouldn't use that for an, an industrial project, for example. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm gonna talk through some of the comments we received on the previous draft and uh, also the updates that we made to this draft. One of the comments we received um, uh, quite a number of times was that technical advice would be better given in a technical advisory rather than in the, the guidelines, the CEQA guidelines themselves. Um, so we moved, um, uh, the bulk of, uh, of, our, of, of what we've um, provided um, out of the guidelines and into a new technical advisory. Uh, the guidelines are now just a couple pages and the technical advisory is um, uh, somewhere in the 30s. So let's talk a little bit about recommended thresholds because that's one of the real, um, that's been one of the, one of the uh, uh, topics that's got the most attention in, in this process. How do you set thresholds for, for the, a vehicle, uh, vehicle miles traveled metric? Um, so two major comments on residential project thresholds. The first was that uh, there was desire, a desire for more flexibility in threshold setting. There was 
the concern, uh, particularly among outlying cities, that uh, looking at the regional overall VMT per capita um, might leave them without much or any area um, that they uh, would have under the threshold, so would lose them maybe any streamlining that VMT, the VMT metric um, uh, would offer. Um, another issue uh, raised was that uh, regional VMT per capita, or regional average, kind of in shorthand, um, uh, is, n as we recommended in our previous draft, is not a, a good enough threshold, not a stringent enough threshold for um, to to uh, move us towards our state goals, such as greenhouse gas emissions reduction, as well as all of the other um, uh, goals uh, associated with VMT reduction, uh, such as energy savings, um, uh, preservation of farm farmland and sensitive habitat, et cetera, um, that we need to do better than, than average. Um, so in our updated draft, uh, we include a recommendation of 15% below regional VMT per capita, um, and, uh, or, or rather, or 15% below uh, city VMT per capita. That means that in outlying cities, uh, you can refer to your own average and develop under our recommended threshold in your travel efficient areas. Um, okay, and uh, a similar comment and a similar change for office development. So again, uh, the average is not good enough to achieve our state goals, and uh, we recommend 15% below uh, the regional VMT per capita. Now, with office, we keep the focus on the regional because commute trips are the longest trips taken on a daily basis, and they very frequently go across city lines. So it makes sense to focus on the regional geography. So we've gotten the question as we've um, gone through um, discussions uh, on this, why 15%? Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we um, came to a figure of 15%. Um, I would also note that, uh, again, I mentioned this a little earlier, but the guidelines uh, are uh, clarify that a city may provide, or uh, sorry, a jurisdiction, any jurisdiction may provide more stringent thresholds um, than are recommended in our materials. Um, and we kind of see our materials as, as uh, they're, they're recommendations, but they, um, they provide essentially the substantial evidence that would uh, allow, we think, a jurisdiction to stay within the envelope of um, today's uh, state planning concerns. For example, that would be that the, the substantial evidence is available to show that um, uh, there is alignment with um, greenhouse gas, uh, in particular with greenhouse gas uh, emissions um, limits and targets. So specifically, um, we point to Caltrans strategic plan, which uh, requires the reduction of VMT per capita by 15% by 2020. Um, SB 375 targets, if you take them collect, if you roll them up collectively statewide, um, they come to approximately a 15% uh, VMT, or sorry, GHG per capita reduction. Um, AB 32, um, the AB32 scoping plan recommends that local governments set GHG reduction targets at 15% below uh, existing by 2020. And um, also looking on the feasibility side, uh, there's research showing that 15% VMT mitigation is generally achievable for both urban and suburban development. Um, CAPCOA's quantifying greenhouse gas mitigation measures um, contains the research. Uh, which demonstrates that. Okay. So um, how about retail development? We have changed our recommendation fairly substantially for retail development. Um, we recommend not only a, a different threshold, but a, a, a new sort of analysis. Uh, the comment we received uh, was that new retail tends to redirect trips rather than generate trips anew. Um, when a new store goes in, people don't start shopping for the first time. They divert their shopping um, to the new store. So there's a question then of whether the new store is in a more travel efficient location than the old array of stores was, and whether uh, VMT uh, 
um, goes up or down uh, as a result. So uh, our updated recommendation is to assess retail development with a net VMT approach. In other words, uh, one would take a snapshot of a, a kind of before and after snapshot modeling with, without, and with uh, the uh, development and see whether VMT goes up or down. And retail, uh, which increases VMT, which draws people from what was closer um, locations to further locations, for example, um, uh, if you increase VMT as a result of building your retail development, uh, then you might be the, you might, that might be considered a significant impact. Um, meanwhile, locally serving retail, because it tends to add uh, shopping destinations into the urban fabric and allow for people to shop more locally, um, go to the new store that might be closer to their house, um, will tend to reduce vehicle miles traveled. And so we recommend that it is presumed less than significant. Uh, again, a less than significant presumption we recommend for locally serving retail. And it's specified in a little more detail in the guidance. We recommend that if a development exceeds, uh, contains a store exceeding 50,000 square feet, you probably shouldn't label that a locally serving. It might be locally serving, but it would be worth going ahead and doing the analysis for such a large store. OK, and how would we treat mixed use development? Well, here's our recommendations um, on that. Um, essentially, you can consider each use separately. So consider the residential portion in, in a residential retail mixed use and compare that to the residential threshold. And then consider the retail and compare that to the retail thresholds. Now that doesn't mean that you don't get, you don't see the benefit of being mixed use. Um, each use should take credit for the internal capture um, that is due to, that it's co-located with the other uses in the project. So the residential development, for example, would account for the fact that some of its trips were just going to go downstairs to the coffee shop or the store on the first floor, and uh, those would get subtracted off in the VMT analysis. Um, I would also note that uh, according to our recommendation, a lot of uh, those typical residential retail mixed use projects, kind of like the one in the picture here, uh, will tend to be presumed less than significant. Uh, the retail portion would be less than significant if it were either near transit, uh, or sorry, the, the residential would be um, presumed less than significant if it were either near transit or located in an area where the development around it uh, demonstrates below threshold uh, VMT. Um, and the retail development, if it were locally serving, would be presumed less than significant. So your typical um, housing over retail development would generally be presumed less than significant. For land use plans, we recommend that um, sub-jurisdiction plans, such as specific plans, uh, use the same uh, recommendations that we use for the for land use projects, the ones we just uh, I just reviewed, uh, and general plans, we recommend that consistency with the SCS, <clears throat> excuse me, the aggregate uh, VMT uh, across the jurisdiction that the SCS um, plans for um, consistency with that um, is um, uh, an indication of a less than significant impact. Uh, for RTP SCSs themselves, uh, we recommend that sufficient VMT reductions in order to, to achieve their GHG targets specified by the Air Resources Board um, would uh, make for a less than significant impact. So how about transportation projects? Well, uh, we've mentioned earlier uh, that Active transportation projects and transit projects, which tend to reduce VMT, um, uh, we would recommend that they be presumed less than significant. So they would generate a less than significant, usually negative, um, and therefore less than significant um, uh, amount of vehicle miles traveled. Um, so we won't have that uh, bus rapid transit problem or that bike lane problem um, anymore, where those modes are on the hook for promoting the automobile. Um, a couple of comments that we, oh, um, and then what about roadway uh, investments and roadway capacity expansion projects um, uh, and um, induced travel, the VMT that results from induced, essentially the induced VMT. 
Um, so we uh, provided some recommendations in the last draft, and the comments we got on those uh, are that the analysis might be burdensome for our small projects. The, the uh, recommendations that we provided, and we still offer those as um, options in this current draft, uh, were essentially around uh, doing the travel demand modeling um, and making sure that land use changes that were affected by the transportation project were included in that analysis one way or another. Um, now that would be a big analysis to do for a very small project like a turn pocket. Um, we recommended that uh, general purpose lanes uh, would be uh, perhaps considered significant, um, that managed lanes would not. Uh, so two comments that we heard um, uh, frequently were that the analysis might be burdensome for small transportation projects and that project uh, that using a project type as a significant threshold uh, is problematic. So we've updated a recommendation in a, in a few ways. Um, first, we've clarified the types of projects which might induce measurable or substantial vehicle miles traveled and which wouldn't, and we've listed them um, in the technical advisory. Um, so an example of a project which might induce measurable or substantial VMT would be addition of a, um, a general purpose lane on a highway. Um, and an example of one that wouldn't would be the addition of a turn pocket. And, and there's a long list of other um, projects which wouldn't be expected to induce substantial or measurable VMT. Um, we have shifted from a uh, project type threshold like general purpose lanes or some kind of some one kind or lane or the other to uh, just a VMT threshold. So a certain number of VMT is our new recommendation um, for uh, a threshold for a roadway project. Um, and how we we also provide a recommendation for how you might uh, uh, develop that threshold, how you might calculate that threshold. And what we've done is looked at the amount of VMT that's allowable. Um, if we are to achieve our 2030 greenhouse gas reduction target. So uh, for hitting our 2030 target in transportation, a uh, considerable amount of the reduction will come from uh, vehicle efficiency and vehicle electrification. Um, some will come from shifts in fuels, but those two together will not get us all the way to our targets. Uh, we'll also have to reduce VMT per capita. Um, and so that leaves us with a certain amount of VMT which we could uh, generate and still achieve our targets. Uh, we take that VMT and essentially divide it by the number of transportation projects to provide a fair share threshold. Each, each um, transportation project gets its fair share of uh, that VMT um, available. Um, in addition, we provide an, a, an additional methodology that's much simpler and easier to calculate. Um, I would say maybe orders of magnitude um, much easier to use, uh, or orders of magnitude easier to use, and it's based simply on the well-researched elasticities of, uh, of, of VMT uh, by lane miles added found in the academic literature. There are about 20 studies um, uh, that we've seen, and they um, generally range in their long-run elasticities between 0.6 and 1.0. And I'll, um, at the, towards the end of the presentation, I'll run through um, some case studies, and, and one of those will be um, using this method. Another comment we heard is that rural is unique. It sometimes can't um, uh, uh, mitigate, there, there are certain rural uses that can't mitigate um, as effectively uh, as, um, it, as you can in urban areas for VMT. Um, there are certainly other rural uses which you can mitigate a substantial amount for, but because of that variation, we recommended that thresholds be developed on a case-by-case -case basis rather than providing the same recommendations that we do for MPO, for areas within MPOs. Another comment is that uh, it was concern that uh, a VMT per capita metric might end up triggering an EIR for a very small project. Um, and we have updated our recommendations to include a small project screening threshold. Uh, if your project is going to generate fewer than 100 vehicle trips, uh, then uh, that's below, that's presumed less than significant. Um, and uh, there were concerns about impact 
impacts to transit, um, we, uh, our recommendation uh, is that addition of riders to transit is not an environmental impact. However, blocking stations or routes uh, may be an impact. Okay, so um, traffic safety. I'll pause here to check if there are any additional questions on the line. Should we take questions now? Uh, any any um, uh, um, clarifying questions on what we've talked uh, no, about? No, I think we're, we're saving them. Okay. All right, we're going to wait till uh, later or the end for the questions so far. So we have um, pretty substantially updated our recommendations for addressing traffic safety. And I'll share um, uh, at least an outline of, um, of where we have gone with safety. Um, since our last draft, we did a substantial amount of research on safety and looked at what the factors are uh, that actually increase safety in, in the modern uh, literature on transportation in the last maybe decade or even decade and a half. Um, and we found that some of the traditional principles uh, that have been long been assumed to increase safety, um, actually the opposite has now been found to improve safety. Um, so from this research, we uh, provide four principles, essentially, uh, by which we recommend uh, safety be approached in CEQA. The first is to reduce motor vehicle speeds. Uh, reducing motor vehicle speeds improves safety, both for people inside and outside of motor vehicles. And folks outside include those on active transportation using the roads. Um, second, uh, focusing on increasing driver attention rather than on accommodating driver error. So the, the um, kind of traditional way of thinking of transportation safety is uh, make the lane uh, a little bit wider and clear the area around the roadway uh, so that if a driver makes a mistake, um, they won't hit anything and they can steer back into the center of the lane. <clears throat> um, the research has shown that that actually makes driver's attention decrease. So somebody might be more likely to take a peek at their cell phone or uh, see what that text that just came in. Um, and uh, the wider lanes actually are less safe than narrow lanes. Um, so uh, that and other sorts of, uh, of methods of increasing driver attention, providing um, vegetation along, along the roadway edge, for example, um, are, are encouraged. Um, uh, third, as a general principle, to protect vulnerable road users. Now, there's an obvious part of that uh, where vulnerable road users don't have protection uh, around them as motor vehicle users do, um, so need additional protection to be um, just as safe as folks in cars. Um, uh, we've seen that uh, in recent years, fatality rates have been going down for motorists, but been going up for pedestrians and for cyclists. So uh, that's a particularly important trend to um, reduce. Uh, we also um, observe that a lot, the, there's research showing that a lot of the, um, uh, that a lot of additional people would be willing to use uh, active modes if they felt safe in them. So there's additional factor of perceived safety um, allowing for for additional um, active mode transportation, if we can improve perceived safety um, by protecting vulnerable road users and not just um, both both making them safer and making them know they're safer, um, we'll then get uh, all of the greenhouse gas, health, et cetera, benefits of, of more having more people transport themselves on their own power. Uh, and fourth and finally, um, we recommend uh, VMT reduction as a safety measure. Um, less vehicle travel means less exposure um, to crashes. Um, and VMT itself and also sprawl style um, roadways and uh, sparsity, uh, rather division of land uses which lead to VMT um, uh, are a consideration here. Uh, we recommend uh, in our discussion on safety to avoid attributing cumulative analysis uh, cumulative safety impacts to last in development. So um, 
avoid uh, sorts of methodologies like looking at queuing and spill out, spill out of a queue, um, which act very much like LOS, like level of service, um, insofar as the last in development, that, that infill development that's built at the end, um, puts those, that last car or two, um, which then triggers a, an impact. Um, we recommend using, uh, uh, employing methodologies that, that don't have that problem. Um, we also caution against uh, focusing on increasing automobile throughput as a safety solution, uh, both because increasing automobile speed, um, which that can be associated with, um, uh, increases risk and because increasing throughput can also um, uh, lead to increased VMT, um, which also is connected to um, increased safety risk. And uh, finally, to where trade-offs are made, um, be uh, careful to consider trade-offs with vulnerable road user safety um, and motorist safety. Um, where an additional um, lane might be seen to increase uh, motor vehicle safety, uh, it will make for a longer and more challenging and more risky crossing for a pedestrian and decrease the pedestrian safety. So I'm going to pause there. Question? Uh, yeah, we had a couple of clarifying questions about the 100 vehicle trip uh, note. Um, so there's two questions that are somewhat related. Uh, the first is where did OPR come up with the 100 vehicle trip threshold for small projects? Um, with an example that a small development with even 10 or 11 homes would possibly generate more than 100 daily trips. Uh, and off of that question as well, uh, is the 100 vehicle trip screening for small projects peak hour trips or daily trips? Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, um, so this is similar to, do you want to answer the question or shall I? Um, okay, I'll go ahead. Um, got Chris Calfe here. Um, who has been hard at work in the last couple of years on 743 um, along with me. And um, so essentially refers to um, congestion management plan um, uh, standard practices um, already. And I believe it's, is it peak hour? Okay, yeah, we're, we're looking at peak hour trips. Um, another question, Sahar, was that the clarifying question? For right I can clarify. Oh, sorry. Answer. One other clarification. Again, this is just, OPR's recommendation in the technical advisory. So uh, that's our recommendation based on the information that we have in front of us. Lead in, individual lead agencies can choose to follow that or come up with their own uh, recommendations based on their own information. Thanks, Chris. OK, great. Um, and the other questions we have on the hook um, we'll uh, save for later. Okay. So moving on from safety, um, we'll talk a little bit about data as we've um, as we've been uh, out and about discussing this shift to VMT. There have been some concerns raised about data availability, and we're happy to announce that the California statewide travel demand model is up and running, and uh, we have posted. Actually, Caltrans has posted on its website. Um, uh, VMT data that it's produced across the entire state. So uh, that data can provide assistance with trip lengths for um, sketch models. So if, if you are using a sketch model um, in order to calculate VMT in an area and it has an input uh, for how long the trips are, you can get those from the CSTDM. And we, uh, there's an example of doing so in our case studies that we'll go through. Um, it can also provide assistance with setting thresholds. <clears throat> so uh, you can use this data to, to, to determine that um, regional overall VMT per capita uh, minus 15% number. Um, and we recommend, uh, I'll, I'll say here for the first time, and this will come up again, we recommend using the same model, um, be it the statewide model or a regional travel demand model, um, use the same model to set thresholds and to, to um, do the analysis or provide inputs for the analysis. So there's an apples to apples comparison. Um, you can also use uh, the statewide model for assistance in generating VMT screening maps, uh, similar to the one um, uh, to the right. OK, let's move on to the case studies. <clears throat> so uh, we'll walk through the case studies, which we provided in our materials. Um, we'll Talk, talk through them at a basically a high level, although um, we can 
get into um, finer details in question and answer. Um, the first of those is a residential retail mixed use um, called Stockton & Tea in Sacramento, California. Uh, the second is a, an office building uh, in Mission Viejo um, called the Mission Viejo Medical Center. It's an office building. Um, and the third is a hypothetical uh, roadway expansion project um, that for, for purposes of choosing which data to use, which region's data to use, we um, did the analysis for a hypothetical expan roadway expansion project in Kern County. Okay, so let's start with the residential retail mixed use uh, VMT calculation. Just a little run through the project characteristics. It includes 214 multifamily dwelling units, 24 single family dwelling units, 6,000 square feet of locally serving retail. It's located uh, just over a quarter mile from a light rail station. Um, and it's uh, surrounding, uh, surrounding um, residential um, uh, exhibits, sur surrounding uh, dwelling units exhibit uh, a, a 2.1 VMT per capita um, uh, on average compared to uh, the recommended threshold, which we calculated again from CSTDM data, the statewide model data, um, at 14.2 VMT per capita. Now, <clears throat> if you look at the distance from light rail, that uh, quarter mile is within a half mile, it's less than a half mile, so that, according to our presumptions, would lead the project, the residential portion of this project, to be deemed less than significant. Um, uh, the surrounding uh, residential is also below um, the threshold, which would mean that if you were to generate a screening map uh, for this area, you would see that it was in the green area, the, the below threshold area. So that is another reason this project would be deemed less than significant. The retail portion of the project, although I didn't write it onto this slide, um, is locally serving retail, and so that would be presumed less than significant. So um, for a few different reasons, this project would be presumed less than significant under our recommendations. However, we went ahead and did the math um, so as an example. So we got the, uh, we calculated the threshold using statewide model data. Uh, we did the analysis of the project using the AHSC greenhouse gas quantification methodology, which um, uh, is posted online. Um, and uh, we use, uh, that, that methodology uses the model CaliMod. Um, we made one adjustment from that, um, from that methodology, from the, the kind of running exactly along with that methodology, and used trip length data from the statewide model. That way, our analysis would be through um, CaliMod would be comparable to the thresholds, which we'd also use the CSTDM to develop. So again, uh, we use the CSTDM, that's the California Statewide Travel Demand Model, for to calculate home-based VMT um, and provide co a common data source um, across uh, the different parts of the analysis. Now, you remember back to early in this presentation, the household VMT uh, versus home-based VMT, and the statewide model enables us to look at household VMT, the, the full tour, without missing out on the trips that are, don't, don't stop at the home. Um, uh, but the data we have on mitigation uh, focuses on trip-based VMT, and since we need uh, mitigation, the calculation of, mitig of VMT mitigation and the calculation of the project VMT uh, to be an apples to apples, we used home-based VMT for, for the whole thing. Um, the statewide model provides tour-based or, or household VMT, uh, but it also breaks that down into home-based VMT, and that data, again, is posted on, the Caltrans, uh, on Caltrans's website. Um, uh, the mitigation is calculated also with CaliMod, um, and that's uh, CaliMod uses a percentage reduction, so that's comparable as well. So uh, again, critically, uh, it's an apples to apples to apples with uh, calculating the project VMT, uh, calculating um, the mitigation, uh, and calculating the threshold. I see the slide has mitigation on there twice, but it's supposed to be threshold. <clears throat> okay, uh, let's look at the office example. So this is, again, 110 square feet of office space um, located in Mission Viejo, California. Um, I pulled down a picture of this project um, from the internet, and it's possible that I've gotten it wrong, but it's something that looks, um, this, is, this gives you the idea of the sort of project that 
it is um, a pure office project, it's not mixed use. So we uh, got thresholds from the statewide travel demand model, the CSTDM. Uh, we um, look, did that by looking uh, across uh, the, uh, the region and finding the overall um, VMT per capita for office uh, for specifically home-based office um, travel and uh, then 15% uh, reduction from that was the threshold. So that's how we calculated the threshold. Um, to look at the project VMT, we looked at the specific location and looked at what office uh, commute trips look like in that location. The, the primary determinant of, of office VMT uh, is the, the location. Um, and uh, for mitigation, uh, instead of using CaliMod, we just went straight to uh, the research that assembled by CAPCOA, and they're quantifying greenhouse gas mitigation measures. So um, we looked at a number of uh, mitigation measures, including uh, implementing a 980 work week for 10% of employees, uh, providing a transit subsidy employees of a certain uh, amount per day, um, implementing a car share program, providing employee benefits program and implementing a, uh, a daily parking charge. Um, so CaliMod provide, or sorry, CAPCOA's uh, quantifying greenhouse gas mitigation measures <coughs> guidelines. Um, I think we have an echo. Let's see what is going on here. Give me just a minute for technical. Hmm. Okay, we're back on the, the webinar program for some reason. Unmuted a couple people. Um, okay, <clears throat> uh, so uh, the um, CAPCOA guidance uh, provides information on how uh, uh, quantifying uh, mitigation measures on, on how to sum um, those mitigation measures, and we followed that guidance uh, and got a reduction amount. So again, uh, we use the CSTDM home-based VMT data, and that's home-based work trip data, um, uh, and um, uh, to get project VMT calculation and, and the threshold VMT calculation, we get apples to apples there. And mitigation is calculated as a percent, so that fits as well. Let's look at the roadway project example. So we talked a little bit about how uh, the methodology we used to um, uh, develop a uh, threshold and essentially uh, ARB applied its vision model to estimate the amount of vehicle miles traveled that we can have in the state um, and still meet our 2030 greenhouse gases goals. Um, so uh, under that GHG constraint, how much VMT can we afford to have? Um, and ARB has done an initial run of that model. Um, that isn't settled and that, that number that they provided so far um, may change. I understand it may have already changed somewhat. Um, we'll be updating our guidance and pointing to, to um, the new numbers. Um, uh, but in any case, you take that amount of VMT and divvy that between uh, the, the total projects, total between the number of projects in the state to create a fair share threshold. Um, so each project has a fair share of that um, VMT. So for uh, the project VMT calculation, again, uh, um, uh, transit and active transportation would be presumed to reduce VMT and therefore less than significant. Um, but the uh, for a roadway project, uh, it would, um, uh, if substantial enough as we've listed the project types, uh, it would tend to induce additional vehicle travel. And using the, the methodology that is new to this um, guidance that is um, uh, the, the much more simple methodology, simply take the elasticity supplied by the academic literature on induced travel and uh, use PEMS data to, um, to determine lane miles and VMT in the region and uh, just put those um, together using simple math. So uh, our uh, example, our sample project, our case study was a 2.2 mile hypothetical uh, addition of 2.2 lane miles um, to a highway in Kern County. Again, an elasticity, just the kind of basic Econ 101, um, elasticity is the percent change in vehicle miles traveled over the percent change in lane miles. So how much does VMT change uh, when you add more lane miles? Um, and you just do some algebra on that, very simple 7th uh, and 8th grade algebra, 
and you come to that the VMT impact of the project equals the percent change in lane miles times the baseline VMT on those lane miles times the elasticity. So we plugged in the data, uh, as PEMS data, uh, from Kern County um, for lane miles and for um, uh, vehicle miles traveled on those lane miles, and we plugged in the 2.2 um, uh, additional miles to see what percent what the uh, what percent those were of the existing, uh, and then applied the elasticity from the most recent uh, major study on induced travel done by Duranton and Turner in 2011. That elasticity um, that they found is is just a bit over one. We rounded to 1.0, and uh, we find uh, a VMT impact. So uh, it's a, a 0.328 percent. Uh, addition to the lane miles in Kern, uh, the the VMT existing is uh, two billion three hundred thirty three thousand and change. Uh, elasticity again one. You multiply those together, and you can anticipate that this project uh, would increase VMT by seven million uh, six hundred and change thousand uh, vehicle miles traveled per year. So how does that compare? to the threshold. Well, here's how we calculated the threshold again. Um, uh, the California statewide um, uh, VMT per year, um, which is this high number, 185 um, billion, the allowable increase of 4%, uh, that was again ARB's vision model, um, and the number of transportation projects in the state anticipated to be completed by 2030. Um, we've done a preliminary calculation on that, and we're in the process of going back and calculating it with greater accuracy. Uh, but for now, we think this is a rough estimate um, and came up with a fair share of VMT per transportation project uh, of just over 2 million VMT per year. Um, so the project VMT in this case is greater than the threshold VMT. It's 7 million and change uh, over 2 million in a small amount of change. Um, so the project would lead to a significant impact. Um, mitigation could include tolling um, on the new lanes or existing lanes, um, management of the new lanes or existing lanes, uh, travel demand management such as providing a park and ride facility or providing a van pool program. Those are, those are a couple examples of a wide array of travel demand management that the project might employ to reduce VMT as a mitigation. And I'll pause for a moment to see if we have uh, questions. Um, yeah, there's a clarifying question back to the first example. Uh, the question is, um, in the first example, can you explain what the VMT mitigation was? Yes. Uh, the first example, there was um, the project itself had less than significant VMT, and so there was not VMT mitigation needed. Uh, the project, <clears throat> excuse me, um, some of the features of the project could be considered uh, mitigation if a project was to be presented without those features, um, adding uh, you know, retail to make a mixed-use development rather than a purely residential development might be one. Um, locating near transit could be seen as a mitigation measure, but in this case was just part of the project. Great. A couple other just clarifying questions. Great. Uh, this one is um, around determining transportation project VMT fair share. Uh, the question is, is the denominator the number of projects of the same type, for example, HOV lanes, or is it all project types? Combined. The, that's all project types combined, and, okay. and that is um, yeah, that that number is all project types combined. And is the denominator the number of projects or the lane miles? Um, the denominator is the number of projects. Okay, great. So the lane miles, um, right? Okay, the total lane miles of the state. No, it's it's the number of projects um, because each of those, uh, well, because transportation projects have the potential to induce additional VMT, and so that budget was um, was uh, in our fair share um, recommendation. That budget is spread evenly uh, over all transportation projects. Okay, and the final clarifying question, again, we do have a bunch of longer questions for the Q&A session, Great. but um, how are the mitigation measures, for example, three quantified? The mitigation, for example, three quantified? Um, Let's see. So for a park and ride facility or van pool program, I don't have off the top of my head the literature or model to point you to um, uh, to calculate the VMT reduction from those. Um, 
Um, uh, but that literature, uh, you, would, you would either go to academic literature on the effect of those, um, if it could specify um, uh, in enough detail uh, what the VMT reduction that would result from, or uh, those can, the VMT the, um, reduction that they would cause could be modeled. Thank you, Sahar, for those clarifying questions, and thanks, uh, folks, for asking them. <clears throat> OK, uh, so those are the case studies. Let's move on to uh, next steps uh, on this process. Uh, the document which we're discussing um, is out for public review. Hopefully, you've had a chance to begin to take a look at it. Uh, and uh, we're asking for comments by February 29th. Um, 2016. There's instructions on where to send comments on our website. Um, next, we intend to finalize the proposal and send it along to the Natural Resources Agency for the formal rulemaking process. Um, our best uh, estimate is that that process will take around half of a year um, and that there will that will be followed by uh, a the, um, the Office of Administrative Law, um, uh, a 60-day process there. So we're expecting um, SB 743 to be effective somewhere around late 2016, the end of 2016, or early 2017. Um, at that time, we are recommending a two-year opt-in period. So for those jurisdictions that need to do some groundwork in order to, to get a VMT metric up and running in CEQA, um, uh, there are a couple years in which to do that, and in our in many discussions, that, that appears to be um, sufficient time for uh, for, for jurisdictions. Um, so that would have implementation required uh, statewide in late 2018 or early 2019, if all of our assumptions about how fast things go in the meantime are correct. OK. Um, we want to just briefly discuss a um, parallel process. Um, it's really in response to SB 743. Caltrans is um, developing some transportation analysis guidelines and updating its transportation impact study guidelines. Um, that is all being done under a, a, um, a not so easy off the tongue acronym, the TAG TISG. Uh, again, the, the TAG will provide new methods for analyzing the effects of transportation projects. Um, and the TISG will um, provide new approaches for characterizing land use project impact on the state highway system. Um, there is the opportunity for, and we would like to encourage, uh, broad stakeholder involvement uh, in this effort. So general planning and impact fees. I want to talk, I have a couple slides, I want to mention those. Uh, I already mentioned that we uh, uh, are lucky to have Sh Sahar Shirazi here. Um, but the last year or so, so far, from uh, US DOT. Uh, and so she brings a transportation background to the development of the general plan guidelines. Um, <clears throat> and we uh, will point out that SB 743 leaves existing impact fee programs in place, um, and that development, uh, local governments can develop VMT-based, uh, but, but local governments can develop VMT-based impact fees. Um, both to ease the CEQA burden and to broaden the types of improvements that could be funded. Um, and let me talk about that on, uh, provide a couple uh, examples on the following slide. Um, first, there is the possibility uh, under 743, uh, 743 uh, provides direction only that LOS will not be used in CEQA. Um, but uh, it still may be used under the city's police power, for example, in, in um, general plans or in the planning process. Now, um, in the general plan guidelines, we recommend strongly against uh, using ad hoc LOS triggered mitigation because that has all of the same problems that we listed at the outset uh, of ad hoc LOS, use of LOS in CEQA. Um, <clears throat> LOS might be used, and we anticipate, at least in the near term, it will be um, used in some jurisdictions, at least, to plan roadway capacity. Um, uh, now, we would first recommend that as that planning process takes place now outside of CEQA, uh, the benefit of that being that um, it's an opportunity for planners to consider trade-offs between specifying various um, uh, levels of LOS that 
that they would like their city to attain. Uh, for example, uh, better LOS will generally mean uh, worse greenhouse gas emissions and uh, more um, long-run cost burden um, and, and an array of other, um, you know, walkability um, is going to, to tend to vary uh, inversely from uh, um, LOS. Um, so those considerations can be made as part of the planning process, uh, but we want to recommend that um, that uh, LOS not be used directly to calculate impacts from an individual um, project, and that recommendation is, is in the general plan guidelines. Um, uh, we also recommend um, developing a, a um, uh, looking at impacts, perhaps by developing an impact fee um, in place of ad hoc mitigation or ad hoc fees. Um, uh, we recommend basing those rather than on uh, num unit numbers or square footage, as, as um, is somewhat common today, uh, basing them rather on vehicle miles traveled so that those projects which load more vehicle travel onto the regional roadway network, um, that those projects uh, also pay a fee um, in proportion to the, the BMT they load onto the network. Um, so that travel efficient projects uh, that don't load much VMT um, uh, don't pay for the other projects' uh, uh, vehicle travel, um, pay to accommodate the other projects' vehicle travel. Um, ultimately, we recommend uh, using accessibility. Uh, there's a few, few different um, terms for accessibility. Access to destinations is another way to say the same thing as is connectivity. Um, we recommend using uh, those metrics ultimately, and they're being pretty quickly developed right now and actually deployed in a couple states uh, elsewhere, not in California at this time that we're aware of. Um, and uh, then continuing to use uh, vehicle miles traveled to estimate project impact. So uh, the way that employing accessibility might work, uh, you might examine various transportation infrastructure investment options and see uh, whether how much they help people get to destinations, do the modeling behind that, and then choose the one that increases accessibility um, while uh, uh, also um, uh, achieving other uh, jurisdiction goals, um, maybe greenhouse gas emissions reduction, neighborhood vibrancy, walkability, um, ag land preservation, whatever those goals might be. Um, doing so, again, allows you to, to balance all of those interests and, and uh, um, doing so outside of the SQL process um, is better for providing that balance. So we've reached the end of the slides and to the period for general question and answer, and I believe that we have a number of questions queued up. Um, so let's start hearing those. Great. Um, so we'll do these more or less in order. Um, so the first is, what is OPR's opinion on benefits to rural areas where transit and ATP is not readily available? Yeah, that's a great question and one we've been asked a lot. Um, <clears throat> so uh, the first, first uh, thing that I would point out is that uh, low VMT development looks a lot like traditional development, um, small town development, main street development, that is all um, pretty low VMT development. In fact, that's reflected in some of the VMT screening maps uh, where some people have expected, well, more outlying small towns uh, would have high VMT. Um, we've actually observed that they, they frequently, so long as they are not commuter um, towns, they don't have a lot of commute travel to um, distant job centers, uh, they tend to be pretty low VMT. So um, uh, using VMT in CEQA will help compared to LOS uh, for maintaining small town character um, and then achieving all of the other objectives. There, there's um, a, another example um, that's been raised is, uh, well, how would you mitigate VMT from, say, a winery, which is, you know, a dispersed land use. You can't concentrate the wineries all in one place because they have their vineyards and they take up space. Well, one thing you could do is to provide a, a shuttle uh, that would get people between the wineries and, and two uh, population centers. That would reduce VMT, and it might also solve some other problems associated with um, drinking wine and then getting in a car. <laughs> um, thanks. Great. Um, the next question is, uh, sorry. any thought on the level of significance 
distance comparison between VMT without a project versus with a project in an urbanized setting? Is there a risk of diluting the level of impact with the use of only VMT? So first, our guidelines don't require using only VMT. Um, one good example is in the city of Pasadena. Um, they have already implemented a, an array of metrics, including VMT, but also including, um, uh, for example, uh, proximity to active transportation facilities. If you build a project and it isn't reachable um, by active transportation, that's an impact. And um, part of the mitigation might be to add active transportation facilities or contribute to their addition. Um, yeah. Great. For transit projects, is there a minimum or maximum corridor or project length to be presumed less than significant? For example, if there are two dedicated bus-only projects and one is short length, a longer project, is it assumed that both projects under VMT would be described less than significant? Generally, providing additional transit infrastructure and additional transit service will um, reduce the amount of vehicle travel. If the transit service is better, that will tend to bring people onto the transit service, uh, and they'll they'll tend to um, drive less. So, for that reason, uh, all transit projects are presumed less than significant. Now, with any of these presumptions, um, if there is substantial evidence showing that it's not true that the project would increase VMT, then that evidence can be brought to bear. Um, we had quite a few questions on the metrics themselves, and I think there were a few, a few slides on this, but um, just to revisit it because there were a few questions. Uh, are there recommended metrics to calculate VMT for industrial, retail, institutional, or non-residential uses? And what metrics would be effective to apply um, if there is no reliable model of regional or local VMT per capita? Yeah, great question. So um, uh, around, I believe retail was included in there, and that might have been before we gave the retail example. So we, we recommend a methodology for retail. Um, for industrial, we uh, recommend that, uh, that it might be useful to look at commute travel to the industrial. Um, but in developing a methodology, now there's a wide array of industrial, and um, it would it would you know there's a wide array of land uses in general, and obviously it's impossible for us to provide recommendations on every on every land use. Um, but uh, when developing uh, a method and a threshold at the local level, uh, we would recommend considering. Um, whether employing that methodology and threshold will lead to the outcomes that we're trying to achieve in SB 743. Um, will they lead to, uh, for example, um, uh, um, shorter trips, less VMT, or um, in some cases, those, those methodologies uh, might simply push the development to a, another location. And in some cases, as, as was the issue with infill development, we're concerned that even with industrial, um, that, that uh, a VMT, that you could uh, conceivably do a VM, use a VMT uh, methodology and choose a threshold, which would lead to pushing the development further away to a less travel efficient location that just isn't located within your jurisdiction. Um, and we don't want to see that, so we recommend um, kind of taking a global, a, a big picture view in developing um, uh, those methodologies and thresholds. Uh, the next question is about goods movement. Land uses related to goods movement are not addressed. How will the proposed rule impact logistic and distribution type uses? And could this rule discourage the development of these critical uses? Um, we are, uh, we've had extensive discussions about um, uh, effects on freight. And uh, I, the comment that I just um, made in terms of industrial uses uh, applies there. Um, the question in developing a methodology and, and uh, developing a threshold uh, for those uses, uh, again, you, you could imagine that doing so, you would simply push a, um, uh, a warehousing development, for example, um, uh, out of the jurisdiction, uh, discourage it, and, and lead to it being pushed out of the jurisdiction to a less travel efficient location. And so um, uh, that's what we don't want 
want to see. We don't want to see if if there are opportunities to craft methodologies for a specific kind of industrial, for example, or warehousing facility that lead to uh, less um, uh, to to reducing um, a truck VMT. Then uh, we would see that as an alignment with the the interests specified by the legislature in 743. Um, so I would just keep those factors in mind in developing a methodology. Great. And uh, I believe you may have answered this, but um, going back to it, how would you recommend analyzing regional trip attraction uses, such as hospitals? Um, hospitals would um, probably, uh, I imagine the methodology um, one would employ for a hospital would be similar to retail. Um, so you could look at whether the hospital provided a hospital option that was closer to people um, or whether it drew them further away, whether it was far on the urban periphery and replaced hospital um, hospital trips that were closer um, might be a, a, a way to look at that. Um, next question is about the Affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Grant Program. Uh, the AHSC guidance refers to guidance that appears to be specifically for affordable housing projects. Is OPR indicating these guidelines can be applied to non-affordable housing projects? Yeah, good question. Let me provide a caveat um, uh, to our use of that case study. So yes, we to answer the question directly, yes, we believe that the methodology can be used for non-affordable housing. It simply employs um, uh, it simply uh, employs the Cali mod model, and and that methodology corrects a couple of the the um, uh, formulae which are, are are currently incorrect in Cali mod, or hopefully uh, are going to be corrected within the model soon. But um, we use that methodology so that we get all the right formulae applied. Um, uh, so, sorry, could you read the question again? There was another piece to it that I forgot. Sure. Um, is OPR indicating these guidelines can be applied to non-affordable housing projects? Yeah. So, so yes, they can be applied to non-affordable housing projects. That's right. And the other thing that I wanted to say um, is that this this methodology is uh, it's it's a basic methodology, and and we're we're anticipating. Uh, you know, we wanted to demonstrate that uh, someone with available uh, and freely available even tools and the data posting that, that Caltrans has posted on their website. Um, can calculate VMT in a, in a pretty reasonable amount of time for these sorts of projects. Um, now we anticipate that there will be a lot of development of, of you know, more detailed methodologies um, in the coming couple of years as, as 743 ramps up. The, the early adopter jurisdictions will provide examples for those coming later. Um, uh, so I just wanted to voice that um, I would be surprised if this was a methodology that we were using when 743 becomes and VMT becomes required in, in two and a half or so years, uh, two and a half or three years. Um, uh, but um, it could be. It, it's, it's a methodology that, that works. Great. A uh, couple of questions about uh, transportation alternatives. So related questions. How can agencies move forward with transportation improvement projects, such as adding bike lanes or road diets? Um, specifically, what justification can be used to move projects forward despite poor LOS, which existed prior to project implementation? And can the benefits of AT alone justify implementing road diets and bike lanes? Of AT? Uh, sorry, alternative transportation. Oh, got it. Okay. Um, so the change that 743 makes um, takes LOS out of CEQA and replaces it with BMT. And as we've recommended, Active transportation projects will tend to reduce VMT, um, <clears throat> and so we've recommended a presumption of less than significant impact. So CEQA, the use of LOS in CEQA will no longer be in the way of active transportation project deployment. Um, LOS can still be used um, outside of CEQA um, in, uh, if, if a city um, so chooses. And that is a different issue that's not formally addressed by 743. Uh, although, as I mentioned, um, we have addressed it at least to some extent in the general plan guidelines. Great. Um, a question about the case studies, or I guess a suggestion, um, which is that a lot of people still deal with residential subdivisions of some sort. So a suggestion to insert a case study for standard.
standard projects, such as subdivisions, community commercial projects, or something of that sort. I don't know if you want to speak to that at all. To, the, to insert a what? Sorry. A uh, case study about standard projects, subdivisions, community commercial projects, or something. Oh, I see. A case study about, OK. Yeah. Uh, maybe one that would show an outlying residential project that would um, <clears throat> that would trigger the threshold. Yeah. yeah, I think that would be valuable. I think we would like to, to um, uh, yeah, I, I would just say you could use the same methodology on an outline project. Um, you would plug in the trip lengths and the CSTDM, um, <clears throat> sorry, um, that would be um, for that location. Uh, and then you would plug in the numbers into CaliMod. Um, and so it would be a very similar analysis. Um, uh, what we didn't show maybe was mitigation that you would use. And um, you know, for a standard suburban development mitigation, there, there's a wide array of mitigation. I would look to the CAPCOA greenhouse gas emissions um, uh, quantification guidelines. Uh, but for example, including retail in your development, um, including uh, active transportation paths um, to that retail development from the residential development, um, providing a high level of connectivity rather than um, uh, loops and lollipop style um, roadway uh, roadway deployment. Uh, the next question is is um, a concern about using Cal E mode. Uh, there's a concern that Cal E mode penalizes good mixed use projects next to transit, and is there something that VMT calculation will do to address that? Um, so Cal e mode is just one way of calculating VMT. Um, I guess I, I kind of covered already that I expect that there, well, there already are a number of ways of calculating VMT, and, and uh, um, they'll be common um, before long. Um, so um, there are questions. Uh, so I'd also say that CaliMod itself is undergoing improvement. Um, there are sorts of mitigation um, that, that some believe are not fully accounted for. So the, the uh, the research on VMT mitigation, in some cases, hasn't hasn't the recent research hasn't made its way into that model, um, so you don't get full credit for some of the, the benefits, like being close to transit, perhaps, um, <clears throat> or other mitigation. Um, so uh, uh, you have options. Is the is the is the bottom line there, and and things are improving, but you might be right that it doesn't fully account um, right today. So uh, another question on um, traffic diversion. How does the pro proposed roadway method deal with diversion of traffic from other roadways in the area? And how do you know whether the new VMT is truly new? Yeah, great question. So um, the, methodol the new methodology we provide <coughs> um, refers directly to the academic literature, which provides an elasticity, um, <coughs> excuse me, which focuses on um, the amount of new um, VMT that's generated um, by a uh, roadway capacity project. So that is already taken account of in um, the, the um, new and simple methodology. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the research has shown that, 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 that um, the, the research focuses on the additional VMT and the new VMT. Those other methodologies um, that we provide as examples um, that involve modeling uh, also will account for the, the model will account for the different um, trip paths um, and uh, the either addition or reduction of VMT uh, as a result. Um, we recommend, for example, um, there are some projects which you wouldn't want to use the simple methodology. Um, for example, uh, here in the Sacramento area, um, there. Um, <coughs> My understanding is there's a proposed river crossing. It would essentially provide um, more connectivity. And the effect of in increasing vehicle travel would be, um, uh, would be swamped by the effect of uh, shortening trips as people could take the new shorter path. Um, so for projects that are unique like that, we recommend um, actually doing the modeling. Um, and there will be some projects um, that are key bottlenecks, uh, key large regional bottlenecks, which could be expected to increase VMT uh, more than the literature would suggest. So in those, we recommend doing the modeling as well. We have a couple more questions about the fair share calculation, um, mostly just questions about why the numerator and denominator were chosen, uh, why not lane miles, and why not total cost of project? Hmm. Um, I suppose those might have been other routes. Um, 
off the top of my head, the 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 um, there is precedent for a fair share allocation of an impact. So the numerator part um, is easy. It's what it's the VMT that we can we can uh, have uh, in and still hit our 2030 goals. Uh, the denominator piece. Um, uh, is uh, essentially we used a kind of tried and true um, uh, fair share method um, that has uh, a, a precedent. Great. Um, so a question about the relationship between the state and federal sources of funding. Um, the clarification of an earlier question about the corridors. <coughs> Excuse me. The legislation SB 743 defined a transportation zone as anything under four miles in length. So would a project like make any difference in how to study this in preparation for receiving federal funds such as new starts, um, where they still require LU or not require but use LOS? Right, and uh, <clears throat> it's my understanding, and Sahar, you are the expert on this, that that um, the federal programs don't require LOS, so that sometimes um, used. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I'm not familiar with the four mile threshold in uh, SB 743, um, but in general, the more lane miles added um, uh, via a transportation project, uh, the more vehicle miles traveled you would expect to be induced. That's just um, uh, the basic relationship there. And I'll, and I'll add a clarification that I know the US DOT is looking at this question of uh, LOS and where it's required and where it's used and trying to clarify that for um, states across the nation. So hopefully there'll be better guidance on that coming out soon as well. Um, on page 27 of the revised proposal, any land addition under, sorry, in quotes, any land addition under 0.3 miles in length, end quotes, is listed as a project not requiring analysis. Does this mean additional through lanes at an intersection do not need analysis? Um, so the 0.3 mile figure came simply from looking statewide and observing that uh, a lane of that length will not trigger a significant impact anywhere in the state. So we can comfortably say that that's below, that will um, lead to below threshold BMT. Um, so a through lane through an intersection, uh, depending on its length, um, could conceivably um, uh, trigger more VMT than the threshold, but it would depend on the length of the lane. Okay. Um, a question about the opt-in period. Why is OPR recommending such a long opt-in period after SB 743 becomes effective? Great question. We got a lot of feedback um, from jurisdictions. Um, uh, both that were um, calling themselves early adopters um, and ones that that, uh, that may not be particularly early adopters. And uh, all around there was concern that enough time, that they would need enough time um, in order to do the technical work to develop their threshold. They, they, um, they may um, use our guidance as a starting point or they might adopt our guidance, but in any case they need to go through both the technical and political process uh, around doing that. And there was concern that, um, that a year would not provide them enough time to do that work in a quality fashion. A uh, question about safety. Um, it was stated that uh, to try and avoid attributing cumul cumulative safety effort, uh, issues to last in development. Can you please clarify that statement? Um, Federal Highways identifies Q-lane analysis and increase of storage capacity as a potential form of mitigation for LOS. Right. So um, that's, that's uh, putting a finger on, um, on the issue we're talking about. So um, <coughs> uh, Development and particularly infill developments um, will tend, just as it tends to trigger LOS, will tend to be the development that places that last vehicle or two in a queue. They might have it extend onto a main line, thereby triggering a significant impact. Now, in California, we have enshrined in state law um, uh, planning priorities, which say that infill development is our priority. We have greenhouse gas um, uh, targets and laws about achieving those targets, um, which we, um, through exercises of 
ran SB 375 and, and others um, are clear, we will need to focus our development in an in infill fashion um, uh, to, um, to get where we need to go to achieve those, those targets to sufficiently reduce um, our VMT and GHGs. Um, so we are recommending using caution not to have uh, to set up uh, to create a setup where the last in development um, uh, leads to significant impacts, burdening the infill development um, with solving that problem that's really a cumulative problem that's really uh, been contributed to by all the projects that have um, associated with uh, vehicles on those ramps. And, and those projects would be located some, um, it, you know, picturing in, in, in a central city area. Um, some of those projects would be in outlying areas and some of them would be um, centrally located. So uh, it's just important to set up a methodology that doesn't unduly impact infill development. Um, one last question from earlier on. Which is regarding the calculation of the VMT, specifically whether the VMT calculations are done in both the near term and the cumulative. I presume that's the scenarios. Do you want to answer that? I'm thinking that the Generally, you're looking at the maximum VMT. Is that correct? So I'm talking to Chris Kelfi, who is our CEQA expert. It's the projected future VMT associated with the with the project. Right. Okay. Um, unlike level of service, where you would look at today, starting when the project starts and 20 years out in the future, uh, the VMT calculation is more similar to a cumulative impact. I caution to say, though, that uh, we would still be expecting that lead agencies analyze not just the VMT of the direct VMT impact of the project, but also consider other cumulative development and its impact on VMT as well. Thanks. Um, are there any additional questions, or have we run through them? I think we covered uh, all the questions, unless I missed one. Let's um, let's wait a minute and see if any additional questions come in, because uh, we can still receive questions. Um, and if not, we'll wrap up. But we'll give you guys a minute to uh, to think, and if there's any additional ones, please go ahead and type them into the question box. Uh, we did get a few questions about whether this PowerPoint would be posted. Yes. Yeah, we'll post this PowerPoint on our on our website. We'll also post a recording of this webinar on our website. Uh, just question just came in. Can a new bus service be used to mitigate a new freeway link? That's a good question. Um, adding transit uh, would be mitigation for uh, the VMT induced by a roadway project uh, if that we're going if, if the new transit project could be shown to reduce VMT. So basically, the question uh, would be the, the answer to that question would be yes. You may mitigate it to a degree. The, the question the question is still open whether it would mitigate it to a less than significant impact. So that the lead agency would need to do that analysis. So an estimate could be made of the VMT reduction resulting from the transit. Um, uh, project, uh, the transit improvement, <clears throat> and uh, and that could be um, credited towards the mitigation for the for the um, roadway project. Okay. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so the question was asked uh, about validation of the statewide uh, model. Um, you know, I think I'm not even going to try and answer that one. I'm sorry, but um, I can point you to reach to the um, the uh, modeling folks at.
Caltrans who have been um, uh, developing a statewide model. I, um, I do know that there is more validation work to do, um, that the VMT numbers coming out of the statewide model are not perfect. Um, compared to the accuracy of LOS, we're comfortable that they're ready for use. Um, and another thing that makes us comfortable with their use um, right out the gate uh, is that um, they should be used in comparison to thresholds also developed by the, by the statewide model. So even if they aren't, um, if there is error in an absolute sense, um, that, that you, they sh it should provide reasonably accurate relative um, uh, VMT numbers. In, in other words, for example, um, calculating a threshold for a region and then calculating uh, trip lengths um, for that region, uh, those would, would be comparable and, and appropriate for use um, uh, today, we believe. And I would just add on to that, you know, CEQA's standard for adequacy is not perfection, but that it provides, the information provides a significant, sufficient information to help uh, decision makers to make an informed decision. So we think the statewide data do provide some information to help make a decision. It doesn't need to be perfect. And I would actually add, we, uh, the, the, the statewide model, uh, we're, we've used it for our examples. We have the data in, in hand. Um, we expect that in, within MPOs, generally speaking, that uh, the MPO model would be used. It's generally going to be finer grained uh, and more accurate, um, more precise. Um, but the statewide model can be used in other areas. If there's an MPO that's unable to supply um, data or outside of MPOs, the statewide model can be used. It can be used, um, yeah, it can be used, it's, it's adequate for use anywhere in the state, but it might not be the best choice. Um, it's, it's likely not going to be the best choice, uh, especially in urbanized regions. Okay, great. Um, there's another question on fair share allocation for transit projects question is, are all transit projects treated equally? That is, does a large transit project get the same fair share of BMTs as a small transit project? Um, the answer is, is yes, and it doesn't matter. Um, so uh, yes, large and small projects get the same fair share under the, the, um, the uh, technical advisory, the, the, our recommendation in the technical advisory um, currently. Um, and that goes across um, all different sorts of transportation projects, including uh, transit projects and uh, roadway capacity uh, projects. Now, it doesn't matter because a transit project, large or small, uh, will tend to reduce VMT and therefore not trigger a significant impact. OK, uh, clarifying question. Um, you indicated earlier that the threshold for small projects would be 100 peak hour trips, but on page 20 of the guidelines, it indicates the threshold is 100 daily trips. I might have misspoken. I would need to go back to the guidelines on that. But um, if we've written it into the, into the technical advisory, um, uh, take that rather than what I'm telling you now. Sorry about that. Question regarding roadway discussion. Narrower indication that narrower roadways are safer and more desirable um, with landscaping closer to the roadway is not in line with state traffic manuals, highway design manuals. So will the state be changing those documents to be consistent? I'd say those conversations are ongoing. Um, hypothetical scenario, if a project is near transit, but the transit service has been reduced, what effect does that have? There's a minimum transit service that qualifies for, um, so I didn't explain this in detail, so I'm glad somebody raised it. Um, there's a minimum transit service which qualifies for that, um, that, create, that can create that radius around uh, transit where um, uh, some uses are presumed less than significant. And that, that is a 15-minute a headway. So if the bus 
bus, if, if a bus line, if it's around a, a, um, a bus station, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, the service is reduced from 10 minutes to 20 minute headways, then that would lose the presumption. Great. Okay, so a question um, about what uh, what does VMT measure that all isn't already covered by uh, greenhouse gases? And I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. So I, I put a slide up near the beginning that um, that essentially was the answer to that question, but it's a, a whole array of other impacts. So um, uh, you know, transportation energy use. Um, uh, and fossil fuel burning uh, creates greenhouse gas emissions, but it al also creates air quality problems, and, and there are other environmental impacts associated with, um, you know, resource extraction, um, et cetera. Um, so there's that. Um, VMT is also correlated uh, with um, water use, we found uh, in the literature, um, because high VMT development tends to be um, there's a correlation with density and uh, larger lots um, uh, have more irrigation and require more watering. So there's a connection there, especially here in California. Um, and then VMT also correlates with consumption, uh, with land consumption, similarly. Uh, so uh, uh, consumption of farmland and sensitive um, ha habitat. Uh, for example, so so those are some of the additional environmental factors which VMT um, is a reasonable umbrella over. Reason it, it isn't a, VMT is kind of a shorthand for an array of environmental impacts of which GHGs is, is an important one, but just one. Okay. Actually, um, let's let's look at the next one, and I think Chris um, Kelsey might be better to answer that one. Um, the sec yeah, Chris, if you would look at the second to last question, so we uh, oh go yeah, we can go ahead and take it now. All right. Um, Sorry, the pauses as we if we look at your your good and meaty questions. Uh, question regarding general plans: If the applicable general plan still uses level of service, does this create any general plan consistency issues under CEQA? if the lead agency uses vehicle miles traveled to analyze transportation impacts? Uh, excellent question. So there is the requirement in CEQA that one evaluate potential inconsistencies with an adopted plan. And the requirement specifically is that you look at inconsistencies that would result in an environmental impact. The statute has said that once the guidelines go into effect, then level of service or auto delay shall no longer be considered an environmental impact. Uh, so for CEQA purposes, that to the extent that there's an inconsistency with the local land use plan, that's not a CEQA environmental impact. To the extent that there is, in fact, an inconsistency with the city's general plan, however, uh, that inconsistency would need to be resolved before the lead agency could adopt the project. Any additional questions? Two, okay, two more, great. I think we have time for, okay. I think this relates to a couple more. A previous question. SB 742 relies on a definition of major transit stop and transit priority area and recently enacted AB 744 also does, but references, quote, an unobstructed path end quote, to transit. Is that concept going to come into SB 743 as well? The um, concept is not spelled out overtly in 743, but remember that proximity to transit is a, um, we recommend it lead to a presumption of less than significant impact. And if there is an impediment to getting 
to the transportation, getting to the transit from the project, uh, that would be substantial, pretty clear substantial evidence um, contravening uh, that proximity. Um, yeah, go ahead and go ahead right. and let's let's hit uh, up. Final here. question. The GHG chapter analyzes BMTs already and generally requires mitigation for the GHGs. How is the transportation analysis going to add anything new to information in the EIR? Yeah, that's a good question. So GHG and VMT for transportation are pretty well correlated. Um, however, of course, greenhouse gas emissions can be mitigated in a number of ways that don't uh, involve um, the reduction of, um, uh, of VMT. So there's a number of, of uh, additional um, mitigations available that, that, that reduce GHGs but not uh, VMT. And again, VMT is associated with a, an array of environmental impacts. So this uh, focuses attention more squarely on, on uh, VMT and, and um, seeks to uh, mitigate those array of, of impacts. All right, are there any more questions? Okay, so we are near the end of the hour. Um, so we'll hereby wrap up this webinar. We thank you so much for attending. Um, we welcome your comments on our work and uh, the current draft that's out for comment now. Um, again, uh, the instructions on providing comments um, are on our website and the comment period runs through the 29th of this month, through this full month. With that, we'll go ahead and end the webinar. Uh, we'll be hosting another webinar in a week or so. Um, please see our website uh, for information on that. Thank you.